Well, it is so exciting to see so many people come out to uh, see how posters work and make posters in our workshop. It was really fun this afternoon to see all that making and doing. Um, I'm Ellen Lupton. I'm senior curator of contemporary design here at Cooper Hewitt Museum, and I organized how posters work with Caitlin Condal and Gil S. Davidson, who are both here in the audience. I'm very happy um, to see them. Um, and we had a great event today with Globe Poster from Micah. <laughs> yes, so that's really cool. Um, and Katie Evans, who's an art director at Ivanka Trump and also a MICA alum running our color bar. And Renee Put and Rihanna Petter, who are from the Netherlands and who are going to present tonight their design research on, on how posters work of their own sort um, in Amsterdam. So we're really excited about that. Um, special thanks to the Adobe Foundation and the Dutch Consulate uh, for making our exhibition possible, and especially uh, today's program, where we were able to bring designers from the Netherlands here to, to, to work and make and do and, and talk about uh, what they do. What, what we're going to do is I'm going to talk briefly about the exhibition that just opened yesterday uh, that's upstairs on the first and second floor. Um, here at Cooper Hewitt. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the curatorial idea. This is called a curator's talk. Um, and show you a few of my favorite stories and, and things from the exhibition. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to R Renee and Rihanna, who will talk about their project. And I'll introduce that a little bit. And then we'll have a short conversation um, and hear from all of you. And we're going to keep it on time. We're going to get you out of here by 6.15, um, so you can go to an Industry City in, in Brooklyn and see all the amazing uh, design stuff going on there tonight as well. Um, but I'm really glad that, that you're here to talk about posters and graphic design. Um, so I've been doing exhibitions about graphic design for many, many years, um, longer than many on this planet. Um, and it's an interesting challenge, because graphic design um, is not really intended to be exhibited. It's intended to be used. It's intended to be encountered in everyday life. And in fact, we often don't notice it and don't think about it being there. We simply come upon it um, and make use of it. Um, and so graphic design exhibitions are kind of innately weird because what we do as curators is take the stuff out of its natural habitat and create environments like this one. This is our show, Graphic Design Now in Production on, on Governor's Island in, in 2012. And it's a beautiful installation, but it's not how we encounter graphic design in everyday life. And so graphic designers themselves often complain about this. <laughs> and it's one of my historic um, ironies as a curator that it's the graphic designers that always complain the most when you make a graphic design exhibition. And, and the way they complain is they say, um, it's problematic, a very intellectual way of saying like, I have an issue here because you've taken graphic design out of context, right? You've um, put it on a wall, you put it in a case and we can't touch it and uh, we're looking at it in this kind of unnatural way. Um, Bryn Smith is a wonderful young design critic and she, she did a whole project where she studied all the complaints about graphic design exhibitions um, where people have talked about it's like putting a bird in a cage and it's like putting a young person in prison and right it's it's this it's this terrible violence that we do to graphic design taking it out of everyday life a and i look at that conversation and it kind of annoys me because in my opinion that's the whole point is that as a curator we take these things out of the street out of the store out of the airport and put them in a beautiful place like cooper hewitt museum so that people will see it and pay attention and, and, and in essence that's what a museum is a museum is a machine or an apparatus that allows us to pay attention to art, to history, to ideas, and yes, to graphic design. Um, and so as designers, we often are encountering 
the products of our discipline um, isolated from use, right? So we're on the, the web all the time and looking at blogs and looking at um, designers' own website. This is the identity for the new Whitney Museum, uh, designed by Experimental Jet Set, who has a whole group of posters on view in our exhibition upstairs. Um, and this is how their work looks on their website. Um, it's very beautiful and elegant, and it's isolated from use. And, and here it is on 23rd Street, right? And I kind of like it both ways. Like, I like I like encountering graphic design in real life, but I also like having a chance to um, focus on the discourse of design, what, what this is about. Um, this is a bookstore. This is how books look in a bookstore. It's one of the places that we encounter graphic design. These are two editions of the same book, uh, one created for my mom and the other one for a sexy housewife in Brooklyn. Um, and it's the same book, but, but graphic design is used to create a different focus and a different audience and message for the same content. Um, but we also encounter book covers in places like this, right? Like the, the, I, the Apple bookstore on your phone. Um, and so graphic design has to live in these different environments at, at different scales. Um, both real and unreal, right? Real and uh, represented. Um, graphic designers have an obsession with we hate it when type gets squished, you know, in Photoshop or Illustrator. We feel that that's a great violence against uh, letter forms. I know there's some very important font designers here who would, would agree with me. But when I look at this, I'm like, well, here's an instance because of the context of use that actually this type looks really awesome, <laughs> right? Because it is such an emotional statement and it's in this compressed space of a bumper sticker, like the context um, justifies the means, right? Um, and, and the fuller context of this is not only is this an amazing bumper sticker, um, but when I saw it on the streets of Baltimore, it was on the back of a driver's ed car. <laughs> And it's that full life that we have to celebrate when we think of design living out there in the world and all its in, in glorious uh, self. Um, but I like to say, here we are in a museum, and a museum is also a context for graphic design. And so when we were, our team here, talking about, let's do a poster show. Cooper Hewitt has over 3,000 posters in our collection. Uh, many of them have never been exhibited. Um, we haven't done an exhibition exclusively about posters, I think, since the 80s, and Gail Davidson could confirm that later. Um, but it's been a long time that we have devoted an exhibition just to posters. Um, and the concept of this show is to not do a, an exhibition that's really about posters at all. It's really about visual language and visual communication. Um, and what we did is we identified 14 design principles and we went through the collection, both digitally and going through the drawers in our amazing state-of-the-art storage facility in Newark, um, looking for ideas, looking for ways that designers do things uh, with form. And then to use the poster as the kind of um, laboratory of graphic design, right? Posters are where designers have, for 150 years, um, explored the medium. Uh, they have pushed the language of image and type and communication, and also just used it in the most base ways to, to sell things and to argue for a political point of view. Um, and so that's what we did, is we, we took it out of context and, and put the posters in the museum in order to look at how design works, how two-dimensional design works. Um, and so here you can see some of that. Um, so the whole show is organized as this kind of visual dictionary of these simple design strategies. And we, we produced a beautiful book um, with the exhibition that has 
almost three times as many posters in the book. So to me, the, the book is like the, the ultimate exhibition because that will last forever, right? In a few months, these posters will all go back in their drawer. Uh, but that book uh, will make these particular pieces that we pulled out of our, our archive um, available and documented and on view indefinitely um, through that medium. So that's, that's super exciting. So what I'm going to do just for a few minutes is show you some of the principles in the exhibition. Um, and it's really important to me that they're all active. They're all things that, that you can do as a designer or just as someone at design. Um, and they're not rules. Um, so some of them contradict each other. Um, they're more, they're phenomena, they're, they're tools, they're techniques um, that designers use. So the first one is called Focus the Eye. Um, and this is one, one of the first things I think we all learn in, in design school, right, is that you have to show people where to look. You can't just have a whole bunch of stuff all scattered around or people don't know where to look. Um, and graphic designers instinctively do this and they train themselves to do this. So these are two, two posters from the you know, mid 20th century from our collection. They're both uh, war propaganda posters, um, one for World War II, the other for the Spanish Civil War. Um, and in both cases, they, they feature this, you know, very realistically rendered object or scene. Um, and everything the designer has done around that, like, focuses our attention on that single object, right? The lighting, the stuff going on on the ground. Um, but what I think is really cool also is that both of these posters have um, a diagonal element, right? They're not um, sitting straight up and down. Um, so I took this poster and I, I made it straight, like just to see how they <laughs> like, I could do this all day, right? Like, this is what we do, right? Um, and so the poster has this thing stuck in the middle, but it's not static, right? And by, by putting... Um, the object on an angle, and the other one does that too, right? The, the sort of angular thing on the, on the dinner table is creating this dynamic point of view. Um, and, and, and we were really interested in design theory and the kind of history of, of looking at, at posters. Um, Bruno Minari, the great Italian designer, wrote an essay in 1966 uh, making fun of posters that just have a big circle in the middle. Um, and he thought that was like the dumbest thing ever and this very lazy thing that designers do was just this big round thing. So of course I had great fun finding all the examples in our collection that just have a big circle in the middle because it is a, it always works, right? So next time you're stuck, put a big circle in the middle. It really works. Um, <laughs> And one of my favorites is this poster by Gottlieb Solon, who is a Swiss modern map of the 50s and 60s. And we think that this poster is actually referred to in Bruno Manon's critique. Um, big phonograph in the middle. And designers continue to, to use this strategy because it's universal, it's, it's really functional. Uh, but sometimes they do it kind of in reverse or, or find a way to problematize, there's that word, problem, again, to make it problematic, uh, to put a big circle. So this is by Felix Foffley, um, who we believe is the youngest designer represented in our exhibition, amazing young uh, Swiss designer. Uh, this is his poster for Future Islands, more Baltimore, okay? We have a big Baltimore group here. Um, so his poster for Future Islands has a big circle in the middle, but it's an empty circle, it's a void, right? So it's not a center of gravity, it's this kind of um, light, right? Shining out of the, of, of the center and dissolving everything around it. It's this kind of emptiness, right? Light. Um, and so I love how he takes a cliche of design and uh, really different uh, from it, something new. Um, in the same gallery upstairs, we have this category, overwhelm the eye, which is the opposite, right, of focusing. We'll put you in mind, of course, of psychosters which tried to confuse you, right, using uh, colors and, uh, you know, type that all runs together with, like, negative kerning and um, 
in order to, to create an optical experience that is the opposite of focus, right? That challenges you to test, right? Um, a kind of graphic design analog of being high. Um, and other designers today continue to experiment with this and to create posters that, that are not about focus, um, but are about this kind of optical assault. Um, and we think that is super interesting. Um, and that's a, an ex kind of experimental edge of graphic design, this creation of new languages, right? Um, another area I really like is the idea of storytelling. We have a lot of posters that are very narrative in quality. Um, one of my as a curator, really in my whole career, was an afternoon uh, spent with Caitlin and, and Gail in our uh, storage facility looking at drawer after drawer of posters. And we came to this one. Um, it's one of the first posters to be collected by Cooper Hewitt. It's a World War II poster. Um, and this was a common theme. A lot of, um, a lot of posters were made that, that told this particular story. Um, and the story is that if people um, on the ground were uh, mindlessly talking about information that they knew about troop movements or where a ship was going to go, the enemy might be listening and the enemy could then sink the ship. Um, so a careless word, a needless sinking, right? This is, this is the propaganda message here. They didn't even have Twitter then, but you know, people <laughs> could still. Um, and so this, this poster very literally tells the story. We see the burning ship. We see the sailors in the foreground in their lifeboat, right, watching the ship burn. We as viewers are in that boat with them, right? That's our point of view, right? It's a point of view, and we're in the boat with those guys watching that ship go down. So, so we're at, the, the curators are in, in Newark looking at this poster, and we turn that poster over, and under it is another poster that tells the same story, but in a different way, a better way. Do you want to see it? <laughs> OK. I'm going to show you. OK. Whoa. OK, it just says, someone talked. Right? And so he got rid of the ship. He got rid of four words, eight people. Yeah, it's just. One guy about to drown, and the point of view is now he's reaching out to us because it's our fault, right? We are implicated in this terrible scene. Um, so to me, that was just like, wow. <laughs> to be able to find those two things is truly um, stunning. Um, and then I later learned that that poster was uh, directly inspired by these posters by Abram Games, uh, who's the great modern uh, British uh, poster designer who was the official poster artist in the UK during World War II. Um, and his posters were also about getting rid of all the excess and, and creating a pure emotional connection. Um, and the U.S. Office of War Information hired Frederick Siebel to copy Abram Games. Um, so it's also graphic design. Nothing's ever new, right? You're always copying something. And then we have posters like this, uh, amazing film posters that are very narrative um, and take a kind of anti-Hollywood stance, including a lot of uh, Polish posters, like the one on the right, which is for Rosemary's Baby. Um, and the artist has created his own very weird and creepy representation of the movie, um, which for anyone that remembers this movie, which is just ingrained in my psyche, um, this scene never happens in Rosemary's <laughs> Baby. We never see Mia Farrow touch the devil child that she has birthed, right? We hear the baby cry at the end. And the message at the end of the movie is that she is going to raise the kid, right? It is her baby. She's going to take care of it no matter what. Um, but they never really touch. And we never see this happen. Um, kind of cool. Um, another, another category is, is Amplify. Um, and the idea that um, graphic designers are about turning up the volume, right? We, we have visual means 
uh, that we use to um, make a message more urgent, to make it louder. We use all caps and giant type and alarming images, um, screaming faces, right, uh, to create visual noise, right, to turn up uh, the volume. So here's two wonderful uh, posters, and the designers of these posters are, are here in the audience tonight, so I'm really pleased that they came out. Um, Terry Foreman, this piece is featured in our, in our book, um, and she's using the all caps, the exclamation point, hand rendered italic type to show this kind of anger and rage and urgency of a message. Um, and Anton von Dahlen here with also all caps, um, using imagery and double entendre and the multiplicity of language, um, really alarming. Um, and intense, right, that, that grabs you emotionally. Um, and his posters were designed to be either spray painted on a wall, or he could use the same stencil to create a print on paper, uh, like you see here. Both of these posters are from a collection that was given to Cooper Hewitt in the early 90s by Steve Heller and Carrie Jacobs, the Angry Graphics Collection. Um, so we're really excited to be able to show quite a few of them and, and put even more um, in our wonderful uh, book. And then finally, make eye contact. Um, we find that so many posters people emotionally um, through the eyes um, that we as human beings want to connect with people uh, through the eye. And these are two posters by, by Paula Scher, one which features this, you know, giant eyes that, that bleed off the screen, but the other one that replaces the eyes with type, um, and in a sense, creates even more emotional uh, impact by deleting that very thing that we want to connect with. And putting the type there, sure, you know where to look, right? Because we're always looking for that um, eye contact. Um, and that brings me to this, which is, uh, the, pro the project poster number 524 by our Dutch guests, uh, Renee Put and Rihanna Petter, who are here from the Netherlands, um, to be with us. And, and they did a special installation in the exhibition, which is really their research on how posters work. And, and they're going to tell you more about it, but they, they collected five three commercial advertising posters and cultural posters from the streets of Amsterdam, real functional stuff, not artsy shit, you know, but functional posters. And they subjected these posters to all kinds of analysis visually, um, including this where they found eyes as being the central focus um, of dozens of posters, that that's the place where you're supposed to look. Um, this is from the cover of their book, which is an amazing uh, document where the, they've taken all these experiments and research. And th this book is available upstairs um, in our museum shop. It's very rare. You really can't find this book in the US, except in the most specialized places. So we're, we're really excited that we're able to display the, this original uh, project in our exhibition and, and share it with you. Um, so this is from their research on, on focal point, which you can see upstairs um, in our opening gallery, Gallery 106. Um, and I am going to now introduce them, um, invite them to the stage to talk to you about this project, which is a really original piece of design research. Wow, love it. OK, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for being here. Okay, maybe we start uh, right away because we need our time. Uh, our project started, uh, in fact, uh, at the Gerd Rietveld Academy. I'm a teacher over there, a professor, and uh, they have an institute called uh, uh, the Institute for, uh, Research Institute for Art and Public Space, and that allows uh, professors of the Rietveld Academy to do an independent research project. And I worked uh, several times with Rihanna together on uh, projects uh, very successfully. So I thought let's uh, share together this uh, invitation to do a uh, research project. Um, the, the subject of our uh, uh, research project was uh, we had to find a good 
um, project uh, for our research. So we thought, what would be an interesting subject to study on, to do research about? And uh, we were looking for a research project that was, which was related to our field of graphic design. So we came up with the idea of posters. A poster is related, of course, uh, to our field of graphic design. So for us, it was really uh, the thing we wanted to do research about. And of course, it's, it's a part of the urban environment, so the public uh, place. Uh, for us, it was also really important that we uh, have emotional contact <laughs> with the poster too. And um, yeah, we, we think um, um, the form and function of a lot of posters are uh, based or seem to be based on dominant uh, conventions. And we consider it important to develop the poster. So that was a good reason to research it, I think. Um, first, we're going to show some impressions because Amsterdam is uh, way different than <laughs> streets in New York, for example. You see an impression of and a variety of posters in the city. Um, you see as well as commercial and cultural posters. And you see here some legal uh, poster <laughs> spread out and legally. That there's a huge variety and they are distributed almost every week. You see a lot of uh, presented in the city. And so that's a rich culture, visual culture, visible in this poster uh, design. But then the question became a little bit for us, uh, also uh, being part of this uh, research group, how can we do uh, research? How can we somehow set up uh, uh, a program for ourselves that we could start really doing some uh, some research with visual outcomes. Um, and we were thinking about uh, maybe we should gather some material. Uh, we needed something to research. Uh, you can't research the poster in general. That's impossible, I think. And it was also too abstract to research the posters in the streets. So what we did, um, we contacted three different uh, um, distributors from the posters in Amsterdam and we asked them to uh, collect every poster they collected during three months. So we get lots of posters of them. In three months we collected 523 posters and um, uh, there were four sizes. So the big uh, bus shelter posters, A0, A1 and A2. What you see over here was, was this whole But uh, already what uh, Ellen was talking about, it was hard for us to study them in their habitat. So what we had to do was uh, to bring them back from the streets to our studio. So in that sense, that became our laboratory, to be able to uh, study these posters and to analyze these posters based on the visual components they were designed with. The whole stack of posters on the floor of my studio in Amsterdam. Um, we were also looking for a way to uh, study these posters uh, physically. So now we had these posters into my studio, we could really start cutting straight through the posters. So um, we were looking for these methods of research that you get visual data, and that was a way for us to get into the material. So here so you see some pictures of the working process? Yeah, we wanted to reveal the DNA of the poster. So we, we started cutting out uh, parts of the poster, the building blocks of posters, for example. We show it later on. And we, we proce the process was, uh, we made a lot of pictures with of it. Um, we used, uh, so as well as uh, um, digital as analog methods. And uh, sometimes it took us like days to, to make a poster or a new, a new work. And these are all pictures from a working process, so you get a little bit an impression of the studio, you get a little bit an impression of the, the method of working. And the intensity. And then we started to, then now we will show you some results of our research. Um, and we started with one of the most interesting, or mo let's say mo one of the most urgent questions was, what is the focal point of a poster? Uh, what, what are you looking at if you look at the poster? What attracts the first at the first time your eye? Yeah. 
So from each poster, we cut out the focal point, the size of a circle of 10 uh, centimeters diagram, a diameter. Um, and these uh, separate circles were pinned on the wall uh, within an empty space we, we made on the wall um, and placed in exactly their uh, original position. So what you see here is actually a kind of visual data visualization. And these are 220 posters and 20, uh, 220 focal points. <laughs> and you see them we build it again here upstairs in the exhibition. Yeah. When we were looking at the final result, we also had a little bit of feeling, hey, this looks also somehow familiar. So what, oh, here you see the final result. But how can we read this image? How can we understand it or how can we look at it? So what we did, we took the colon section, which we are all familiar with, and we put it on top of this uh, result we had uh, constructed on the wall of my studio. And then we find out that everything was in that sense completely within this uh, colon section rule. It was even like that, that at the heart of the center of this colon section, that was also the biggest pile of post of, of focal points. So it, in that sense, it was, um, it tells a lot about how, how we have learned to work with compositions and that these conventions work very strongly throughout uh, all the designs of the posters. At the same time, we were also a little bit looking at um, what kind of um, focal points did we really cut out? You already saw it in the presentation of Ellen. And then you could really make or rearrange these focal points into certain subjects like the eyes. Very strong uh, color contrast uh, elements or even what also attracts our eye is of course typographical elements. And this was another subject, uh, reading direction. Uh, <coughs> uh, we have examined in which uh, direction both image and text can be read within the poster. And we separated them. So these are uh, all the lines uh, of text, the text uh, composition. And if you compare it with the image, you can see that the image is far more dynamic used. And the text is really... <laughs> Static. <laughs> and again, these are um, stacked on each other. So it's again, uh, all these images are actually visual data. So when we were deconstructing our own deconstruction, <laughs> we found out this uh, beautiful uh, chaotic composition, which we liked a lot. So we made some pictures just to show you, um, uh, let's say, how we also have worked with this uh, composition, but also as, as an inspiring image in between uh, our process of working. But then, um, and that was also interesting in our whole research, was that we worked in the beginning with a lot of analog methods, and later on we started to do more digital uh, deconstructing um, methods. So we thought um, what you have seen in the first with the green and the red lines, uh, we thought maybe it would be nice to bring in again the material of the posters. So we took, we took the same method of working, but now with the very thin stripes of, uh, of the posters. And then you get a complete different result in, in which, this, let's say, the material of, of the posters is still remaining. And uh, therefore, uh, maybe closer to what we wanted to achieve with uh, our research. And we wanted to achieve that the material tells the story itself. Exactly. Uh, reading route, um, that's another subject. Um, in the previous one we separated text uh, and image, but of course it's all one composition that you read. So, um, um, most of the posters are a combination of image and text. So the reading route is a character per poster by drawing a li line between the main focal points in image and text. The hierarchy uh, can be read off from the thickness of the line. Sometimes it's also nice to have like a really aesthetic 
outcome. <laughs> Which was at the same time also a little bit problematic for us sometimes because if the outcome is so aesthetically beautiful, then you really start doubting uh, a little bit the, 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 the value or the, the extra value of the, of the, of the visual outcome. Yeah. And we, what we tried to do in our research was to avoid, let's say, starting to design because as a graphic designer, you are so trained to design interesting, let's say, visual uh, messages and we had to avoid that in our process. So in that sense, we tried to design more a method of working which could lead to a visual outcome uh, than, uh, than a design itself. And this is about after image. Um, if, if you go through Amsterdam and you see all these posters uh, day in, day out in the city, then you see so many posters biking from your studio to your home that you get almost a kind of uh, a visual narrative. And uh, it, it is interesting to see that if you, if you see these poses for two seconds, there's always this, let's say this image, which is like an after image on your, on, in your eye, which, which stays there. So what we did is we brought all these poses back to a kind of uh, very, con uh, let's say to a hardcore image, which was black and white, which you could consider as an after image on your retina. Um, if you bring these images together into a kind of animation, then you create a new kind of visual rhyme. A kind of, and that's in, in fact what happens in your, in your head if you bike through a city. And this was for us a way to find out how that could work and if that could also be, let's say, a um, concept for designing a poster. And it's constantly three layers, so you see the black becomes gray and lighter gray and then it disappears. Some people can remember five images maybe. But I think we already know of course a lot of male and female images on posters especially the advertising posters, the huge ones. Um, it's an important motive. Um, let's show it. So this was something that we already knew. So what we did, we cut out again all the parts, all the skin parts of the female and put them back in the same place we found them and stacked it up to it on each other. And this was the result. And if you compare it with the male parts, See, it's a complete different image. A lot of testosterone. <laughs> and a lot of Photoshop and blur. And <laughs> to make it more smooth and more sexy. And, and also the, the amount of, of parts, body parts, you see is also pretty different. But it's again, it's so beautiful that now the material itself tells the story and proves itself. <laughs> Another component which we were interested in was composition and form. And if you look to a lot of uh, posters, what we already said in the beginning, they seem to be uh, based on dominant conventions, and like sy sy symmetrical constructions, outline elements, or geometrical shapes. So what we did in this um, research is to abstract an image, post the image into a very abstract form, so that it is only the elements which you see, like a yellow triangle, a red uh, color of field and a black uh, shape in, uh, in the bottom. Uh, two abstracted images, like you, you saw before, were connected uh, with six uh, in-between steps. And um, you get like um, intermediate colors, you get intermediate forms and intermediate compositions. So compositions, colors and uh, details that don't exist yet are not designed but come up in a, in a technical area. It's, it's just made an illustrator. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's a secret maybe. But <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, um, um, make a transition between two forms but we made a transition between two posters. So for us it was really inspiring and also shocking to see that we used to uh, make uh, compositions with, with um, geometric forms and, or organic, but this is something in between, as you can see here. And also 
yeah, the, the small, not really touching, but almost touching, almost annoying, <laughs> um, um, came up. And I think in my profession, I bring it up. I think I, I bring it in. <laughs> I mean, and because also here, in, in also in this trans transformation, you can ask yourself why are let's say the the beginning and the end of the uh, the poses we abstracted. Why do we use these compositions and not the ones in between? What kind of possibilities could we uh, learn uh, or can abstract uh, extract from them? That would be an interesting way of making finding new solutions for compositions with color and form. And the same thing we did with the place, the place where text is located. So also here we abstracted the poster into very black and white compositions. And also here we transformed from one poster to another poster, which became almost like a um, constructed, con Russian constructivist, uh, <laughs> how do you call it? Constructivist is... Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And here you see the overview from one poster to another poster. Also in uh, six steps. Or eight different, yeah, six different steps. Then we did a um, deconstruction based on graphic forms. Uh, graphic forms are normally used to bring in a, post a certain hierarchy to uh, separate information from each other, to be able to, uh, let's say, put a lot of information on a post and still make it uh, accessible and readable for the viewer. Uh, we were very interested in these specific forms itself. Um, how are they designed? How do they look like? Um, uh, how, 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 how are they used? Are they only functional? Are they also used decorative? Or how can you look at these graphical forms? So also in this case, we deconstructed all the graphical forms out of the poses, which was an enormous work because some of them were really, really tiny and uh, you had almost to, to, take, to take care not to uh, cut in your fingers. But it was really uh, an, an, an interesting um, uh, way of showing how these graphical forms um, together, because they also are very, let's say, if you make them into a subject of a poster itself, then they become suddenly f uh, rich and, uh, and interesting. And if sometimes if you see them in a poster where they are used, they are almost invisible. So it's, it, and also we could ask ourselves, where do they come from? Are they based on the tools we use all, let's say, in InDesign or, or Illustrator? Or do we also create these, uh, tech, let's say, these graphical forms ourselves? It was really great to do this because for all the subjects it was. It is so nice that you can focus on one um, element of being a graphic designer. Normally you work with text, with color, with image, and it's nice to do. But now it was uh, crazy to, to just focus on one thing, especially in this one. It was really, uh, the outcome was really great, I think. <laughs> Then we will show some, uh, let's say, some, some color deconstructions. Uh, in this uh, deconstruction, you see we took the, the two colors, which were the main colors used in the poster. So you have a big surface, which is printed with color. So which two colors are the most important colors used in a poster? We cut them out in small pieces. And then we arrange them in a different uh, diagram, which is in that sense a color diagram. And if you do so, you get an also an interesting um, uh, information about how these colors are used. And this, in this case, you see that there's still a lot of black and white, which means that there's still a lot of contrast uh, used in posters. Uh, then you see that blue, red, and yellow is, 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 is present. And then completely right on the bottom, you see four golden pieces of uh, color, which says something about the exclusivity of, of, of the printed matter. But this was a way to show a little bit how we use color, or what kind of colors we use more primarily in posters. Yeah, we had uh, also some nice conversation with the distrib distributors of the poster. 
And we sat down with the guy and he was saying, yeah, if you, have, if, if you want to make good posters, you're a designer, you have to use yellow or red. Because <laughs> that's, that's the, the signal color you have to use. I said, okay, <laughs> let's do that. So we separated all the yellow parts from the posters. All the red parts from the posters. All the blue parts of the posters. And again, this is not designed, this is just getting them out of the, the existing composition and putting them back in the same place. And the black part. And, and also in this poster, we were surprised by the outcome because it's, again, it's very beautiful aesthetically, but at the same time, it becomes almost like a black and white monochrome. And you see all these different shades of black, which is based on full color black painting or spot color printing or, so, in so although we choice to only to take this color out it leads to an enormous potential when you look at this image uh, by let's say the using the color of black as a color this is the last uh, subject of color um, we had the urge to compare every poster um, but how to start and where to start and what to do so what we did you can see it here uh, the original poster, we uh, made a picture of it with five by seven pixels, and we again blew it up at the original size. So you only see like... Together, all these posters together. Which resulted in an animation which was uh, yeah, also very seducive and very tempting to look at. Yeah, it, was, it was nice to, um, as an image in which the invisible becomes something and the visible appears in nothingness. I think this takes 20 minutes, this animation. <laughs> <laughs> Is it okay, Ellen? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, this is, let's say, the final, uh, let's say, image or animation we show. Um, just to say something about this artistic research, I think we were very happy that we found a publisher who was really interested in publishing th uh, this research uh, so that we really um, get a publication out of it. Um, I think it's also very important for a researcher that he can publish his work and that other people can take, uh, let's say, knowledge of that. Um, we had, and in that case, um, we were surrounded with some very good people, like the publisher, like Jeroen, de Jeroen van der Boomgaard, who was our lector, and Jauke Klerenbezem. He was uh, an author who wrote a really beautiful about this uh, research uh, and gave it a really nice context. Um, being able to publish this book was also very good because, therefore, Ellen bought this book in Amsterdam, and that was, of course, um, for us, we are very lucky with that because now we are standing here <laughs> being able to present this uh, research of ours in New York, which is uh, an amazing uh, uh, place to be and an uh, amazing place to, uh, to present in this context of the Cooper Hewitt, uh, our work. So thank you, Cooper Hewitt. Thank you, Ellen and the whole team for having us here. <laughs> so. Um, so that, w that was super great. So we have about 15 minutes to, to talk and um, I, I had a few just comments or things I'm interested in that part of what you're doing is to, um, to celebrate the undesigned, right? And to, um, to find, it is, and it's, there's fiction in it, right? Which I think is what makes art interesting. <laughs> Right, it's to find the most um, banal aspects of graphic design. Like my favorite piece in your project is the graphic elements poster, where they took the stripes and the Greek uh, circle and the violator splashes and 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 put and made this poster that was only those pieces 
right, that have the least meaning. You never focus on it. Right, and they have no meaning. The, the function of those elements is only to make you look at something else. Exactly, yes. And then you took away the thing that we're supposed to look at so that we only see, right, the handmaiden, right? <laughs> we see the, in a, in a sense, it's graphic design at its most naked, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what graphic design does, is it makes you look at something else, right? The content, the message. You and say you've erased the message and the content. And I th think that is the most beautiful um, piece. And, and it also, to me, shows graphic design as something very fragile, <laughs> right? These delicate little pieces of visual trash, <laughs> right? That have been nope. lo lovingly, anyway, I've, maybe you talk a little bit about undesign, non-design. Yeah, I, I think when it comes to graphic design, you always try to make a, let's say, an image which can speak for itself, right? which is somehow mm -hmm. is uh, bringing across a message which can be understood by a lot of people. But in this case, we were not able to design, let's say, a new image. We would somehow we, we found for ourselves a way to do uh, making images that can somehow um, speak for themselves, but just the method of working resulted right. in this visual uh, outcome. But I think it, it, it touches the, the principle of graphic design uh, the same way as maybe that you have to make a whole new image, uh, bringing across a message you have to uh, communicate to a lot of people. Uh, if you right. get an assignment, then you make something, but we gave ourselves now an assignment. And so we could also choose our own way of working. Mm -hmm. But I think in, a, in principle it was yeah, it's very close to our natural uh, profession of graphic design, what we did. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right, because graphic designers are often working with other people's typefaces, other people's content, other people's photographs, other people's money, right? Yeah, yeah. And that through all that being on the edge and the outside, is then you make something, right, that people look at and understand. Yeah, and I think, a lot, Rihanna, a lot of what you were focusing on in, in your comments was about creating these um, ways to generate images in which you were not designing, right? So these in-between forms and using the illustrator technique yeah. to create these ugly things, right, that are beautiful in their oddness, right? And they're yeah. not being touched by intentionality. Yeah, it was a method that I let the poster play playing themselves mm -hmm. <laughs> into new uh, compositions. And for me, it was really valuable, yeah. I like that, the poster playing itself like a song, right? How about from the audience? I'd love to hear your comments or thoughts or concerns or, yeah, I, uh, some of us might look at problems, this research and, and the exhibition as well and say, well, it's very formalist. Right, that you're not interpreting the meaning of the posters, right? And in a way, this is a, 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 a going back to a very modernist point of view, but from, I think, very much from our own time. Is anybody disturbed by that? Um, we have great historians here of, of posters and the political poster. Um, we have political poster artists here who may see this as very uh, precious. Anyone want to f have a comment? Um, yeah, let's Hi. talk. Um, I thought it was very beautiful work, so I'm not against it at all. But I do have a question. When you were putting together the, um, the collages of the different pieces on each poster, how did you decide what was in the foreground, what was in the background? Did you yeah. think about that? We for forgot to say, because we put all the big images on the back so that every part would be visible and sometimes it was the same size as maybe something is not visible, but the idea was that everything was kind of... I mean like in the visible. color study, you would put the biggest black thing yeah. and then the next one, and it, like a yeah. wedding cake. Yeah, yeah but uh -huh. we had a lot of discussion already about this color diagram, because it was, let's say, a different way of uh, getting these colors in a different order. So we could also have done it horizontally. So it was a little bit, how do we... How do we make this color diagram? Yeah. So we, then we could talk, let's say, two days about uh, shall we do it horizontal, shall we do it vertical, shall we do it... So, so that was... There you already make somehow a decision in, in how to, uh, let's say, in how to arrange this, uh, this, 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 this content. And I think in the case of the... 
the, the, the female or male, par male part that was mu much more based on it, this very honest principle about, okay, the biggest part uh, underneath and then you make it even smaller and smaller. It was more like a construct, felt more like a construction. Yeah, right here. Um, how, I'm not sure if I missed this or not, but I apologize if I did, but um, how did you generate like the different versions of the colors? Did you handpick them or was it through some software and, yeah? No, we really um, cut, cut those colors out of the posters. So we had this amount of posters and then we decided to let's take out all the yellow parts with a knife and then uh, considering what was the yellow part and then bring it back on the original position. So there was no digital uh, question involved. After that, we also tried digital <laughs> because it was that much work and um, you also lose the material. First, when we collected all the posters, we made them also digital. We photograph photographed every poster so that we always had the original image again. It was, was such a pity. Yeah. <laughs> Now, the, the color, um, what I told the anecdote about talking with the guy, the distributor, he said yellow and uh, red are the com most, uh, the best colors to use, otherwise your poster is not good. So it, it was a kind of reaction, okay, let's look for all the yellow and red parts. And then after that, we thought, oh, let's do also kind of the CMYK, you know, the black and the blue too. Because these, these, these distributors, they have also a lot of research themselves. I said to keep really track about um, how, po how posters, how effective these posters were. When they make a campaign, how many people have looked at these posters, how many reactions are there, how do people... So th they also do a lot of uh, intern research themselves, and that's also why we came to this uh, information. We have a question here. You wait for the microphone, that way our um, internet audiences can hear your question. Um, is there, in, during this deconstruction process, was there any one single thing that really surprised you in, in, in when you got to that point? Uh, yeah, for me, it was what, what you already pointed out. The, the, um, it's, I call it the in-between forms, but it's what it's called again, the... Um, Tweens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, that something was designed, what was not designed, it came up. And normally, you, yeah, I, I choose a form and then I place it there and you, you create it and now it was created and it was a kind of a gift of the, the software and that was yeah, a big gift for me to realize that you have to do something else sometimes than your um, what you're normal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. And over here. Hi, that was amazingly painstaking research. So my question is, how has that informed you? How has your research informed you uh, in moving forward and doing your own graphic design work? <laughs> that's, a f that's a very good question, of course. Um, and we had a lot of discussions about, you know, how can you, what's the value of this research? Well, how can it help us to make a step forward, maybe in, um, in designing uh, visual messages? Um, I, I think what is interesting in this case is that on one hand the focus was uh, more based on the fact how you could do artistic research, what kind of tools do you have, how can you develop those, and what can that, what kind of outcome can that um, uh, can that uh, give you, and how can you then look to these uh, to these outcomes, and looking to these outcomes, sometimes you were not so surprised because it was maybe quite predictable in the case of the focal points. It was a little bit like okay. You know, it seems to be a very str strong convention. Um, yeah, maybe. Uh, but at the same time, by presenting it like this, it becomes uh, an awareness which we, which you could still start um, um, rediscuss redis rediscussing with yourself. The value of this research is that if you look at all the outcomes, somehow it gives you information which could maybe lead you more to a critical approach about making new. Uh, Graphic, uh, graphic design. Yeah, designing rules too, yeah. which I think is so much of what 
people are doing now is yeah. creating these systems and generative systems. I love that this is mostly by hand. Yeah. <laughs> and I think right. we would like to do more research. This, this proves itself, so give me an assignment and I can prove it also on packages or uh, product packages. Or Supermarket. Yeah, another question? Hi. Hi. My question is, what are your thoughts on the future of the poster, such as posters that change, that are interactive, put your face inside of them? Um, how far has your research gone in that sense? Yeah, we did not really <laughs> go in that field. <laughs> okay. But I think it would be really interesting to find out uh, what we could do with th th that kind of possibilities. And I think this animation about after images I think it's a good f example for, let's say, how you could design new images for post images for the digital uh, uh, displays you nowadays also see in Amsterdam. But at the time when we were doing this research process, there was only printed posters in the city. But now you find already the, the digital, let's say, uh, displays in which you already see that designers take use of that. And let's say telling a message not in one poster, but let's say do it in, in three steps or in two steps. Which is, of course, uh, yeah, a, a new uh, area to go into. Although I think if you can make one really good message, that should be enough. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's maybe not always the best way that you have, let's say, the possibility to make ten posters. You know, it can also be an excuse to uh, to avoid uh, the real, concrete, radical uh, choice in design. I guess. Yeah, p we have a question up here at the front. Someone I'll stick one in, in between. Oh, okay, excellent. Uh, was there any part of the research that you didn't include in the book, or did you use all of it? Um, we actually we put everything in the book. The book is our process, and I think that is really this is just a part of our project. Actually, uh, we started doing uh, a, a more uh, a matrix kind of valueness of posters being a kind of. Uh, a scientist or something, because we thought, yeah, we're doing research, we have to do it like this. But then we said, after that we tried it, we said, no, we're graphic designers, we want to work with the material. So in the book, it's explained, and it's still the values um, we research, what, what values poster can have, or images can have, are in the, in the book. And it's still an amazing discussion, uh, a way to discuss with students, for example, or just with people, or images, or clients, to see what they think the value uh, of an image could be, or... But, but, but this, this matrix was also an interesting start anyhow, although we lost almost one and a half year with, uh, let's say, constructing this matrix, because we had a lot of discussions about well, how this poster functions in, th in the public domain, and how you could look at it, and what was the motivation of the designer to make this poster, and how can it be received by the public. So it was really an interesting matrix, and we so there is a point when you thought you would do that, because you then eliminated that from the yeah, project. Yeah, I yeah. find fascinating. That was quite a shocking <laughs> moment for us, to be honest. It was because really, really helpful. It doesn't matter what it's about. Yeah, yeah but it was really, really helpful to, to um, see that we had to do it with images. It was a reaction on the previous research. Cool. And I want to hear and then Colin. Okay, thanks. We're so polite. Graphic designers thanks. are so polite. Uh, so I'm very interested to think about doing some kind of sentimental analysis, like uh, because a lot of stuff you're working on here are very interesting, but I wonder what if you filter out some of the graphic design by the emotion status of the respond the, the viewer. Yeah. Right. Now in this case we tried we tried to um, develop methods that um, always have a, always have a degree of subjectivity, but we try to exclude it the objective the subjectivity. So um, that's why we sticked on really the building blocks of the poster and not the meaning. But uh, I really I, I think I would really like to do that as as a part two of this project. So let's. And that's <laughs> also. And <laughs> but and maybe with. I'd love to see that in the supermarket. Like, how do we respond emotionally to cereal and yeah, di diet soda and yeah. meat? Or another city. <laughs> the posters of another city are also interesting. Right. Another country. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but yesterday we heard that in California they make no posters anymore in the city. Uh, That's a pity. Yeah. Colin? Um, I was kind of wondering that 
Um, you talked to the distributor of the poster, uh, and I was wondering if you talked to anybody else in the st uh, in the process of the, the posters being made, like the printer, the designers making the poster, because they kind of strike me sort of as not like high graphic design, but sort of like design mm -hmm. for advertising or for uh, just like really quickly made and what how they self like analyze them if they're making when they're making them. Yeah, we, we did not talk with other designers or with printers about, let's say, our subject of posters. That was, in the beginning, a little bit our purpose with this matrix, to involve all kinds of people who are related to posters, let's say, people who uh, have a communication strategy or the people who print them or the people who design them. And it were also really interesting talks, because in these talks you could also find out that every poster has completely different ideas about what a poster should, how, how a poster should work, uh, or how a, post, how a poster should be designed, or uh, how the relationship between the commissioner and the designer and, and the distributor could be uh, constructed in a way that you could make better posters. And, uh, right, and it's not all the designer, it's these systems and controls exactly. and yeah. the, the guy saying, oh, okay, <laughs> right, yeah. So I think we'll take one, one more question and then Wait, right here in the front. Um, so you're um, My question is about your comments on subjectivity. So color is an experience, right? And it's like a combination of, you know, your receptors and, and individual eyes and how brains interpret it. Um, do you think that an extension of your work would be to show an audience what um, individuals who may suffer with some kind of visual disease would actually see on um because I, I was really amazed at your pixelated compositions mm -hmm. and and I'm, and I'm saying well you know um males are more colorblind than females just because of you know it's on the x chromosome and all that stuff so what are they actually seeing right and i think it would be interesting to make it those inspires you. I hear it inspires you. This, oh, so a, maybe you have nerd. to do the research. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's a great idea. <laughs> Actually, we did this research all to inspire people to do more research that the poster industry, it's what you say, are not that interesting or that different or that... Yeah, so we hope... Yeah, that I mean, that's what I loved about your book was seeing a demonstration of design research and a, a methodology about using the visual material to express itself. And I mean, there's just so much richness there, regardless of what you studied. And I, I love the idea of adding, or bringing in the viewer, bringing in um, some other, you know, a reaction, a reaction to the stuff. Anyway, this was great fun. Um, the museum is open tonight, so you can go see this show and check out the book and posters in the shop and all that. And we'll hang out for a bit and talk with anybody that has more you'd like to discuss. And uh, thank you so much for coming to Cooper Hewitt and seeing posters. <laughs> and, um, and thanks to all my amazing volunteers and all the incredible staff here at the museum that put this whole crazy day together. We're very grateful, thank you.